Um, so you're the first ever high performance podcast guest in front of a live audience of almost a thousand people. Thank you. I, know, I, appreciate I just want to say as well, what an incredible job you two have done, especially in two years. And the, what, the, word, the message that you're spreading around the world is just incredible, sir. Oh, mate, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, oh, thank you. Um, so let's start the way we always start these conversations then. For you, what is high performance? Do you know what? It's similar to, to, to what Gary Neville said. At a point in life for everyone, their performance will change depending on their emotion, you know, what's happening at home, their state, where they are in their career. It's always going to change. So as long as you're always performing to your best ability on that day, then that's all that really matters. So what is it for you at the moment then? For me, it's, it's all about my little girl at this moment in time. Is it? Yeah, she's five weeks old. So as soon as I leave here, straight back home. And for me, that's... Thank you. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> so can I jump in there then, Lewis? Because I know that Willow, as you say, is five weeks old. One of the things that intrigued me when I was reading about your background is that a lot of entrepreneurs we've met often talk about their business being a baby to them. Now, you've run and set up lots of businesses and now you've become a father yourself. What would you say are the similarities and what lessons can you apply from the world of being an entrepreneur to raising your daughter? Well, to be honest, it is very similar in terms of when you create a business, the business is only created because it's your idea that you've pulled out your head and, and it's only there because of you or whoever else you're in business with. And obviously that's the same as having a child, right? You, it's only there because you and your partner made the child. So it's a very similar aspect in that and it takes a lot of nurturing too. Like kids don't grow up to, to, to you know, have all the morals they have without your input too. And that's the same with the business. It's, it's really important to nurture a business when you create a business. You're doing every single job. People think you need to employ 50 different people when you first start. At the end of the day, you are those 50 different people. Do you know what I mean? You're doing every little shitty job there is. It literally down to the ground. And, and that's the same as, you know, to me, having a kid, you have to always be there watching them. It's intensive. I mean, she's only five weeks old, so I'm only speaking on five weeks of experience. It's, you know, change the nappies, and then they're sick, then they poo again. You have to change it again. And that's the same the, uh, as a business. No, not everything goes right. You do one thing, it's, then you take two steps back just to get forward again. So you're in a constant state of learning, right, when you're a new parent. And I guess that you were in a constant state of learning when you first started. I mean, what I find fascinating, right, about you is that how old were you when, when you first started thinking about being a businessman? You were doing all kinds of things at school, weren't you? What was the earliest? I'd say the earliest was, it was probably when I was 16, 15, but that was on a game. That was buying and selling on a game that I used to play. I'd buy, buy something and I'd sell it again to make a little bit of money, and that was kind of instilling this, this habit in me. But you had a mindset at that point, though, didn't you, of understanding the power that you can have, realising that if you can control certain things around you that you can spin it to your advantage. Like, I was still doing a paper round, and I used to wear a Daffy Duck nightshirt, right? at the age of 16, yet you're there thinking, brilliant, I can make some money. So where did this come from? Was, Damien spoke about the golden seed. Was there a golden seed moment where you realised that you could do something different to everybody else? Not, not, I wouldn't say golden seed. I would say we kind of more stumbled across things that were making money and our inquisitiveness to keep diving down rabbit holes then led us to places that made money. It wasn't like, oh, I, I want to make loads of money. It was... What can I do? How are they doing this? And then I just kind of dived down the rabbit hole. It led me there. It wasn't, I left, I didn't, again, when I was at school as well, like I, there was nothing about me that was special. I'm probably one of the most uneducated people in this room, always getting kicked out of lessons. It was nothing, nothing like that. Bouncing ideas as well off friends. And let's just say they would come back with a good idea and then we'd just explore it. That's really intriguing because for those that don't know it, that some of these friends that you're describing about, uh, some of like modern day titans of business, or, or, one, or you've got Reese Wabara that's been a guest on the podcast. We've had Ben Francis that's also been a guest. You've got the Edgerton brothers that you're now working with. What was happening within that culture or that environment that was nurturing so many entrepreneurs? It probably all started with Reese, if I'm honest, because Reese was the only one to break out of a little town that made something of himself through football because we I had a job as you know Ben was a pizza delivery driver my friends was a waiter I worked um, two jobs at Burton's menswear and as a, as a local pot washer at the Grafton Manor Hotel meanwhile 
you know, Reese Wilbarra was playing football um, for loads of different clubs around the world, getting paid, you know, massive amounts of money that at one day I could only dream of. And I was thinking, that is just crazy. How, how is he making so much money so young? And that drove me to, to realise straight away, like, really is possible because he's so close to me. If he can do it, then I can do it. But not in a malicious way, just like he's bringing me up. It was like, okay, I'm going to build something now. And then later on, it came into the fact, full circle, I kind of talked him out of not playing football anymore and let's build a business together. And now, you know, you've seen where it's all gone. So I'd say it's more so the people, just the people around you, they can take you, you know, so to the moon and back. Was, so if there was like teachers listening to this St. Louis, so they were thinking, how do I nurture that sort of entrepreneurial curiosity within young people that can lead them down these rabbit holes that could potentially be successful? What advice would you give to people in that position? Well, it's obviously really hard for teachers too because, you know, they're, they're teachers and they're class of 30 pupils and it's hard to give everyone the same advice because not everyone responds to the same advice. Some people learn from listening to podcasts, some people learn from visuals, some people learn from, from just, uh, you know, writing down things. Everyone is different, so it's really hard to give, to pinpoint advice, but I would just say never undermine someone's thought process on how they get to an answer because... I might conclude a different answer or might think so crazily and someone might say to me like, okay, that's daft, why are you even saying that? But if someone would have said to me, you're going to build a billion pound brand one day, I'd say, maybe so. Did so, you find you were undermined by the teachers then when you were at school? No, but the way they treated me was subject to how I treated them. Like I was a class clown, there's no two ways about it. I'd go into school thinking I was cool trying to make people laugh, and I'd get kicked out of lessons because I'm interrupting another, you know, 30 people's um, uh, education, which is rightly so. And looking back, obviously, now I've got perspective, and that was silly of me, but it was the only thing I knew. I would say if teachers can try and teach perspective on what skills you're going to need when you leave school, even as simple as, like, being empathetic to other co-workers as you go to the next step or... Or just like how to plan your life finances, just simple things, how to plot your life, the power of the routine that school gives you. Uh, just simple things like that. I think they go even further. So you've, you've reached this point where you've got a few kids who are in your year or in your school who are doing amazing things, yet you're Lewis Morgan that's getting chucked out of classes, you're not getting great grades, you're not at the top of the class at any point. I'm really interested when, when the switch happens and you find that actually you're getting some joy out of creating businesses and things. When you did that, where did the ability to do maths come from? Where did the ability to deal with supply chains and empathising with people and bringing the right people on board, where does all of that come from? Because there'll be people in here tonight that would love to start their own businesses and they're thinking, well, I wouldn't even know where to begin. So how did you begin it and what can you teach people in here tonight well it's called fucking winging it <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, honestly there's the, there's the truth <laughs> ladies and gentlemen <laughs> that's, I mean I, I, everyone thinks you've got the answers once you've made it but truth is it's been a it's been a tough journey I mean look at what you've shown us on this podcast the first things you pulled up on screen look you had mics in your hands and like you had a rubbish little setup, but at the time that was that was the dogs. The, well, in comparison to where we are now, do you know what I mean? But like people for, people forget that. Yeah. It's so easy to forget that because as you said earlier, social media shows you the best parts, but it's never like that. When we first started, didn't have a clue what we were gonna do. We just wanted it started off as a supplement company, you know, now we're a, a, a massive Jim clothing company only, and, and the same goes with all, all of our, our other brands. We didn't really know where we wanted to go. I'd say your best things for you to do, YouTube, listen to podcasts like this, listen to people's different life experiences. Google's one of your best friends, Upwork, things like that, where you can outsource work that you're maybe not so good at. But truth is, when you're starting a business, you need to be doing everything, and it is a learning process. And there's so many unanswered questions, including now. I don't know where the next step is, but I'll for sure learn. And how will I learn? I'll either pay someone that knows it, that's already been there, that's got the experience, so I then don't have to go and learn and make a mistake that's going to cost me more than I'm going to pay that person. Or I'll just, well, that's the only reason, to be fair. Otherwise, you're just kind of winging it again. So, which, which is fine, but things take time. Really do take time. I mean, I've been doing things for but, the best no, part but of 12 years. things happened so quick for you, though. Like, when, how long was it from when you first started to when you were actually making some serious money? How quick did that? Obviously, serious money is different to every single person, right? So, um, but I'd say the, 
I'd say f- two or three, two or three years, two or three years. And how hard were you having to work, and how much were you having to sacrifice, and how full on was that experience for that period of time? It was full on. So it was twenty-four. Not, I'm going to say 24 hours a day, but there was always stuff to do. Anyone out there that runs their own company knows you're constantly thinking of the next step. But that's only because it's, for, it's forced. I do it myself. I want to become better. So I always think about what's the next opportunity. The best point I can give is when, I was, when we were in um, uh, Body Power, which is a big expo, this is when we really knew. Was, we were probably making, like, I don't know, two, three grand a week or whatever. We launched these tracksuits at Body Power and we must have made 30 grand in 10 minutes. And we were like, fuck. That's crazy, but I wasn't like, okay, now I can go buy a Rolex. I don't care about that stuff. I was like, if we can do that now, what can we do in the future? What can we build? This is just a start. If we've already done this on our first event, what's going to happen when we go a few years down the line and we do five events with two years on? We did do five events that next year. Again, winging it. We're going around the world, taking loads of athletes. Didn't have a clue what we were doing. Yeah, but isn't this the point, though, is that we're all winging it all the time. We start this podcast, we were winging it. Yeah. He's not even a professor. <laughs> And people like, <laughs> but I think there's a great lesson for people. You know, we spoke about imposter syndrome earlier on. Like, people are winging it all the time. And people assume from the outside, they look at you and go, blimey, look at Lewis and Ben. They've just turned over five million quid. They must know what they're doing. But the truth is that all of us are making it up as we go along. I'm very interested, though. What was it that you did that suddenly rocket fueled that success? I think it was probably when we identified, maybe by accident, that influencer marketing was a thing that we could use as a tool to bring emotion and to bring sales to our, our company. We accidentally stumbled across that. It was the right place, the, the right time in terms of the things we were into that would associate, we could associate with our brands. We were watching YouTubers all the time. They were getting 30,000 views. This is like in 2012. Probably that's equivalent to now on Instagram, like a million views, let's say. It was, it was huge. And it's every single day. And we thought, okay, if all these companies are doing it really well, then how can we do it differently? And, and we thought, we want to meet these people. These, we look up to these people. So if we look up to them, and everyone else that buys our products probably is too. So we brought them over from the US, brought them to a place where people wouldn't have a chance probably ever again to come and see them. And, you know, it, it worked. And from now, as you can see now, influencer marketing is this big thing that everyone knows about. See, but what really intrigues me on that, though, Lewis, is that it's like that old saying that talent hits a target nobody else can. Genius hits a target that nobody else can even see. So you were seeing something that now seems so obvious in hindsight. What was it that allowed you to see trends that nobody else could see, that people could learn from and replicate in their own world? Well, some of the biggest companies in the world are always built upon things that become uh, uh, niches, that become like new trends. There's obviously an element of look there, but to spot an opportunity, you already need to kind of know about the subject, which is why I said to everyone, be as curious as you can. Don't just say no. People want to talk about crypto and they'll say, look, I'm not doing that, it's a scam. But how do you know it's a scam? Like, have you ever actually looked into it or are you just throwing words out of your head? I always try and stay open-minded to everything as much as possible to, to learn about everything. So then when an opportunity does come up, then I can spot it and I can see, okay, well, maybe that's going to head there, head there. But you've had constant big moments, though, haven't you? Like, you obviously created Gymshark and you no longer are involved in that as we talked today, but then you keep going. So when you, end, when you exited from Gymshark and obviously you've got a few quid in the bank, what was the reason to keep going and to find the next thing and to, to push forward? Because I've been given an opportunity, right? One of 400 trillion, I think they're odds are to even being here today and I'm talking to even being born. So why am I going to be selfish enough to throw that other way? Because I've made a few quid at, at 29. Now, that's selfish to me. There's people around the world that haven't even got clean water and because I've made something of myself so young, I'm going to now throw that away and stop working. No, it just shows me how far I can actually go. And not only do I want to take myself there, I want to take the people around me and other entrepreneurs and try and help them kind of build their businesses into, into bigger things too and, 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 you know, treat them right, show them the right things to do and, and teach them everything I've learned. So when it comes to the people around you then that you want to take along and show them on this, what sort of qualities do you look for of people that you want to invest into a business with and, and go and take those opportunities alongside? Businesses, generally speaking, especially for the first, you know, three years, it's all about the people. Like you guys could come to me and say, we're going to, we're going to create a podcast. You know, you could say it's going to have 5,000 uh, plays tomorrow. It could have millions. I don't care. I care about the people in front of me who are pitching me the idea. What are you two about? Like, where do your morals sit? How hungry are you? Are you going to run off when you get a few quid in the bank and, and buy loads of 
houses, cars, jewelry, and switch off because you'll know, you spoke to a lot of people, it's all about the process. The end goal is, is never the end goal. Keep that carrot always dangled in front of you. It's always about the process. In the future, you know, when, when, when you're on your deathbed and you look back, all you've got is memories and it, the money's irrelevant at that point. Do you know what I mean? So that's, you, you can sit back and just laugh about everything and, and that's the most important thing. Enjoy the process. So what are the questions you ask then of people that come into your life? so that you can really assess whether they bring genuine value to the things that you want to achieve and the things that you want to do? I try not to overthink that, if I'm honest, because, you know, you see a lot of people come, you see a lot of people go, you see the best sides of people, you see the nasty sides of people, depending on what's involved. So I try not to overthink it. I believe that I'll just be real with people, and if they're, you know, if they're real to me for long enough, then I'll eventually see cracks or I won't, but everyone has cracks. It all depends on the intention of the crack that appears. Um, so I just try not to overthink that part, but to be honest, I don't really have that much time to make, like, you know, let's say, new friends because I'm just too busy focusing on my family and the people around me already. That's enough, do you know what I mean? So what advice would you give to people when it comes to going into business and mixing that with friendship? Because it seems to me like a blessing and a curse that you, have, you may have each other's backs, but if things go wrong, you lose both the business and the friendship. Yeah, it is a really tricky one. It is a really tricky one, especially because, you know, when you're growing, you both want the best for the business, and sometimes your idea might not be as good as theirs or vice versa, but you believe in that time, obviously your idea is the best idea, and it's sometimes hard to overcome. Um, you know, but all my businesses have been with with friends every single one of them there's not one mdv jim shot uh, the able group these are all people that i've known from school which is which is pretty crazy so i've had, generally had uh, uh, the, for the most part a, a great experience but it can all you know contracts and things like that in place early on are, again always great but it is a tricky one it works for some people it, people it works for others so how often do you get together then when you're in business with friends and colleagues and just Talk about the softer stuff, the values, the vision. How frequently does that happen? And what are the nature of those conversations, then, Lewis? Probably on a, a daily basis, unofficially, because you're always talking about business. You know, the best businesses are the ones that you live and breathe by. You can't kind of just, you know, okay, it's Monday now, I'm only going to talk about the business. Don't worry, like, it's every single day. 50, if I look at my phone now, I've probably got 150 messages from a group chat from people in an able group that are looking for the next big thing or, to, or the, next, the next idea. I don't think you, you ever switch off. Anytime I'm around people that I've, I've got companies with or we speak, it's always, you know, positive things. Like, what are they, what's, what is this company doing well that we can implement? It's always positivity all the time. So how do you handle conflict? when that inevitably rises. I'm not delusional. And the people around me aren't delusional. I think you can't be delusional in business. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Uh, and there's going, to be a reason, there's going to be a reason behind it. But no one should ever say, okay, you're wrong, and that's the only reason. You're wrong because, and I think I'm right because, okay, and then we speak. And then we get to the conclusion, because at the end of the day, it's all about the growth of the, the, growth of the businesses. So... Um, you have to be willing to accept someone else's opinion and you have to be willing to change your mind if it's wrong, which is why I just try and stay open-minded because, you know, I might have an idea of a business and someone, let's say in the audience, might come up to me and say, no, you can do this better. And I'll be like, you're right. I don't have any ego towards that because growth doesn't come from that. So what's the best piece of feedback that somebody's given you that you're in business with that you've taken on board and made a change on the back of? For, for me personally, I get too emotionally involved in things. Um, I'm quite a passionate person when I speak. You, you put it down now, I'm quite passionate and, and, and moving. If people, especially if I'm building something, like they'll tell me, you know, well, I've had the feedback in, in the past, don't get too attached to the thing you're building from an emotional standpoint. It's always the, you know, the best decision for the business. So that's something I've had to work on, which, you know, I'm proud to say I, I'm getting there and I, I'm, I'm at the top. But it's always something you're going to work on. You can never fully, fully get it. We're not interested in what happened with Jim Shark and you and Ben. But what I am interested in is, now that you're no longer involved, that period where you went your own separate ways, what did you learn about yourself in that period? Or what was the biggest takeaway from you in that part of your life? For me mentally uh, and personally, I feel like I could handle a lot more. So going into further businesses and where I wanted to take it and, and kind of, as I said, learning about the process and realise you know, who, actually, who actually matters. Because you think loads of people matter. But when it comes down to it, truthfully, 
there's very few people in your circle that, that matter to you. And that was great for me. It was a part in my life where I can kind of find that out, which was really, really good. It was, it was perspective. You couldn't, you couldn't just buy that. And it didn't change your mind about going into business with friends? No. No, not at all. Why not? Because, well, again, it's quite hard for me to answer. Um, but as I said, every single person is different. I don't, tr- you know, it's a double-edged sword. Like, if it doesn't work here, it doesn't mean it's not going to work again. Do you know what I mean? As I said, I've got multiple businesses with friends, and they're all doing brilliantly. So it was an easy decision for me, and I know, like, morally where they all stand, because I've known them for, since I was 12, do you know what I mean? So we've been through thick and thin, things behind closed doors that no one will even see uh, or know about, what we've, been, what we've been through. But as I said, none of us are deluded. If someone's wrong... We're going to tell you you're wrong straight. I won't pull you up straight on it. I don't believe, you know, if you've, if you've got an issue, you should always address it right away because it's always easier to address. And your primary focus now is the ABLE group? Yes. Can you explain to us what it does and what you dream one day it will do? Because I get the sense that you're someone that has big ambitions. So ABLE group was, um, it was formed, so the Edgerton Brothers, um, they created a, a clothing company as well, which is a women's activewear clothing company, which sells around the world. It's one of the fastest growing companies in the UK. I mean, it's not fully on the map yet in terms of out there newswide, but I mean, these guys are doing 20 million turnover in, in three years, which is, you know, let me just put it into perspective. Like Gymshot took four years to get to that point. So these guys are growing incredibly fast. They're incredibly smart people. It's not their first rodeo. They've had businesses that they've sold before. He partnered with his girlfriend, actually, on another brand called Because of Alice, which is a clothing company for, for women, fashion, um, higher end. And they're growing, again, incredibly fast. So we, we created Able Group. Those are the two companies underneath the umbrella. And what we want to do is partner with other entrepreneurs around the world, bring them into the group and build out the, their vision for their brands. And, and, you know, as I said, everything that we've learned along the way, we want to help them. So you're all about empowering people and yeah. bringing people along the journey. You see, what was really interesting, the success of Gymshark came because you spotted trends early and you got on board with them. But getting influencers on Instagram is no longer a big deal because that's what everybody does, right? You were there at the beginning. So what do you think of the things now that anyone in here running a business needs to be doing to be successful? What are the key drivers in business in 2022? Well, first of all, you need to be, you need to be doing all the basics, right? I.e. being on every social media platform. You know, people say they're not growing. Okay, so why are you not growing? You're not even on every social media platform. You're not doing what's currently out there, what people are doing, right? I always say try and clone. Look at your favorite brands, for example, and look what they're doing well. And just clone what they're doing. All we ever done and all we will ever do in business is look at what other people are doing well, take a little bit from everyone and bring it into our own company because everyone's always doing something better than you, than you are at all points in your life. In business, in life in general, mindset-wise, someone's always doing something better. So just bring it into you and just learn from it. I mean, I, we, we, again, have absolutely no ego to, to I'm going to say, shamelessly stealing people's ideas. Um, but we always look for the future all the time. So for us... TikTok's a massive thing, so we focus a lot on, on TikTok, and, and it's the same. With everyone's business, whatever your business is, you need to really identify who your customer is, what you are trying to sell them, put yourself in their shoes. Like, okay, so if you're selling them burgers, for example, like what type of burger are you really selling them? And advertise it to them, like, and keep giving them, giving them, giving them over and over again. Sell them more than just the product, though. Try and, try and sell them a motion to your company so they'll keep thinking and, and coming back. So I've read that it's often said in business there's the three I's. You can have innovators, people that are coming up with the new ideas. You can have imitators, people that are taking those ideas and making them better. And then the final I is idiots that are coming in too late in the process. What are you saying, Damien? No, I'm asking, where does Lewis think that people need to be on this? Because I think it sounds like what you're saying is getting at the imitator stage. Don't necessarily think you've got to have this amazing idea as an innovator. It's about going spotting and seeing what you can improve. Is that is, absolutely that right? You, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Like, you can't reinvent the wheel. Everything's already been done. Do you know what I mean? Like podcasts have been done before, but here you guys are selling that arenas because everyone loves you guys. There's different things you can do for different businesses, but you don't need, as I said, to reinvent the wheel. I think people overthink everything. Just look at what's doing well, take little bits from everyone, and bring it into your own company. So, so can I ask you about? I know you mentioned social media there, and. It's been a bit of a trend that we've had a lot of guests on here that talk about 
the perils of social media, you know, the idea of the comparison culture and the toxicity of it. But you're suggesting that actually it can be a force for good, which is a different message that we're hearing. Would you tell us a bit more about how you can utilise a resource like that to your advantage then? Well, look at the social media reach is pretty much free. You'd almost, I want to say stupid, be not, to not use social media, but use it in the right ways. As you say, don't compare yourself personally to people on social media because they only show you the best bits. They don't show you in the waking up in the morning looking like shit with no makeup on or, or, you know, or got a bad leg in the morning or go to the gym with injuries. They're only going to show you their one rep maxes. And that's the same with businesses. It's smoke and mirrors. and They're always going to show you the best parts and, and never the bad. But social media is a tool that's, that's free that you can reach every single person around the world, no matter where you are. So you need to utilize that. If, you, if your business is, is, is not on there, then you, you're missing a trick. And how are you with comparison? We spoke about comparison. You know, there are businesses out there turning over billions and billions of pounds. Do you look at them and feel inferior? Do you look at them and feel jealousy? Or do you look at them and feel inspiration? I w- yeah, I never look at anyone and feel jealous in a malicious way. But it's always nice to look at someone and see, okay, you're selling so many products worldwide. Like, Wow. Because what you've done is incredible, do you know what I mean? So that for me not to look at that and think that's great would be, would be crazy. I don't ever envy what someone else has got. And, but of course, we compare ourselves to all different types of companies all the time, but that's because we know where we need to get to. And we can't get to that point without comparing what they're doing well and what they're not doing well because we have to imitate things that they're doing. They've already done it, spent billions of pounds doing it, so why not take their idea that's definitely working because they're still continuing to do it? Because these big companies, they put loads of money into R&D all the time. You don't need to spend the money. Just let them do the dirty work and you just follow (laughs) what they've done. Interesting. So for people that would love to set up their own business, but maybe there's a bit of fear there, there's no, not no, there's less fear for you because you've done it and you've done it successfully. But for people who have that fear in here, what would be your message to them? I know you've got fear, right? But if you, if you don't take the plunge, it's never going to get done. You are the only person that can make your idea work. Your idea will always stay an idea in your head if you don't take action. You know, people want to read books all the time, but never take action. Truth is, you are the only person that can make that thing happen. And I know it was a different part in my life when I first started in business. So it's, it's kind of difficult for me to say because for me, there was no risk there, realistically. What was I risking? Which is why I say to everyone, do as much as you can while you're young. But, you know, what's young now? Because you can live to 100 with all, all the medicine. So everyone in here is still young. Take risks relative, relative to your life. Don't try and risk it all just to make your life a little bit better. You know, with a massive downside, it's all about uh, probability. So take us inside your head then when, you, when you've seen an opportunity and you maybe feel that little bit of fear. Tell us, how do you process it and how do you overcome it? Oh, well, well originally, it, I'm thinking it is obviously scary because you, you, you've got to, okay, you think so far down the road, I think you said it earlier, you always think, you said it with, with your kids, right? It's the same with the business. You think of the business, okay, I know that I've got to get, do, you've got to do look, 100 things before it even gets live. And that's the scary part. But just don't even think that far. Just do the first part, the second part, the third part. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, right? You put one piece down and then the other one reveals itself. Same thing in your business. Just take it one step at a time. Try not to think about the bigger picture. All right, even if you, you get 10 steps down the line and you don't even go with the idea, okay, but you still learn 10 steps that you can catapult your next idea 10 steps ahead. And I get a real sense that you bring incredible energy, right, to the room which you're certainly doing in here this evening. What else do you bring to the table when you sit around with your other investors and your other business partners? What do you see as the thing that you bring to that group? I'm pretty good at uh, kind of hitting on things that become bigger things. So like I'll kind of look into the future. It's, it's something I've got. I'm kind of, I don't know if it's like, a, let, not say a third eye, but so I kind of know-ish if something's going to pop, I don't know, in the next couple of years, which is, you know, I don't know how or why. Anything I kind of see a little bit of an interest in, it always becomes a big thing. I mean, people probably, you know, NFTs and things like that. I've got quite a lot of NFTs. And now it's like huge. Yeah, it's, you know, speculation always runs ahead of value and there's always a time to exit. But things that are, I just seem to spot things early on that just become big things. I don't, know, I don't know how. So who serves as your sounding board then to sometimes say, Lewis, I don't think that is a good idea when you're bouncing off one of these trends that you might have seen? It would be people I've met on the internet that are in a similar circle to that mindset of me because it's some, some of the things you come up with are crazy. You're like, no one else is going to believe that. But you go out on the internet and someone else believes what you're believing. 
which is mad. And then that's it. Then you talk, and you fucking now you talk all sorts of speculation. And you chat to people you've never met on the internet about. Yeah, I speak to people I've never met all the, t- all the time. I just run to like the other day I was learning something about uh, Vivi, which is like a digital collectible platform. And I posted about it, and loads of people started messaging me straight away. And before you know it, I was on a, a call with like ten different people I'd never even spoke to in my life, and they were teaching me <laughs> about something that I don't know about. And straight away, I'm like, okay, let's do this. And then within a week, I, I, I kind of know most things about what I'm looking at. I just speak to loads of people, but in, in regards to like. Our business that's close. I'll speak to, you know, the Edgerton Brothers, Rita Wara, people, people that, you know, have no ego towards their view or my view. You see, what I love about this conversation is I think that quite often people, and it doesn't matter whether they're a business person, <clears throat> whether they're employed, whether they're an employee, whether they're a parent, whether they're a teacher, I think all too often they are, they're too anxious to vocalise what they really think and ask questions and be vulnerable and say, look, I've got no idea, can you teach me? I think you are an absolute advocate for the fact that actually if you project out into the world constant questions, constant energy, constant kind of collaboration, let's do this together, it is incredible the amount, or it sounds like it's incredible, the amount of people that are just out there, either the other side of a keyboard or the other side of a cup of coffee, that are willing to just give and offer and lift you up. Everyone out there wants to do something similar to you, what you're trying to do. At all points, there's billions, you know, I don't know, million people, billions of people in the world. And everyone is trying to, let's say, make it in some way or just come up with some crazy idea that no one's even thought about. So it's always good to go online. That's the beauty of social media. Couldn't do that, you know, I don't know 15 years ago. But now you can go online and find like-minded people. I know people struggle to... Uh, to, to, let's say, make friends because, you know, they don't want to go out, they don't want to speak to people anymore because they just don't, don't feel like whenever they speak to them, they're on the same wavelength. Go on the internet, there's tons of people on your wavelength, honestly. I go to some crazy places. <laughs> if, if, I could, if I could take you some of the rabbit holes that I go down, you, you'd be like, where the fuck, what are you doing, you weirdo? So. Is, this is good because I think that we all assume, don't we, from the outside, that when you've set up a business that is now valued at billions of pounds and you've been successful and you've drawn out, you know, probably more money than everyone in here will ever see in their lifetime, right? We assume that you do things in a really linear, traditional, safe, normal way. I don't think anyone coming into here tonight, would you have thought that Lewis operates in this kind of way? You wouldn't, would you? Just talking on the internet, finding someone in any country in the world and tapping into their brains. I think it's a brilliant message for people to realise that you should ask a question of everyone you meet because everyone you meet knows something that you don't know. Um, Talking of asking questions, while we've been talking, lots of you have been pinging your questions in. So we'll just do a couple of these if you're, sure, yeah, if you're cool with this. Let's see what, um, what the audience in here want to, want to know from Lewis. So uh, uh, Tom in A17, where are you, Tom? Down the front somewhere. Oh, you're up there. Oh, nice. In the posh seats. Um, so Lewis, if you could collaborate with one person who you haven't done already, who would it be and why? Business terms? What's he talking about? Your call. Anyone, anywhere. Who would you like to collaborate with and why? Ooh, good question. Do you know what? I'd probably like to speak to Joe Rogan, to be honest. I've watched so many of his podcasts. And I would... <laughs> what are you doing coming in? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, mate. He gets 190 million downloads a week. We get half a million. Don't stop promoting. I don't even know who this guy is. <laughs> Never, uh, have you heard of Joe Rogan? I never heard of him. See, I didn't God. even... I didn't Why even Joe think Rogan, then? I, I just think, as I said, he spoke to so many different people, and there's not many people I look up to, per se, or, um, let's say, want to partner with, but he would probably be someone that I'd love to speak to, because, one, I'm a UFC fan, and, and two, I've, I, I've always listened to his podcast, even before you guys, let's say, were going, five, six, seven, eight years ago, um, so... I'm not sure if that's the answer you wanted, but... That's fine. <laughs> yeah. We'll go to another question then, Lewis. Um, if someone took all of your assets away and then gave you £1,000, what would you do with it? So that's from Liam in P7. Where are you, Liam? I'd probably... He's gone home. Yeah. Liam, are you still here? Hello, Liam. Thank you very much for being uh, here this evening. I'd, I'd, mm, I'd probably flip on Facebook if I'm on a marketplace. I'd probably buy loads of different things like golf clubs, old furniture, and, I, and I'd, I'd sell them. That's the, that would be the easiest way for me to make money that's guaranteed. I can not say, yeah, you can put it into crypto, all this riskier stuff, let's say. But if I've only got a £1,000, I've got nothing else to my name, I'm, I'm going to get a stable job and I'm going to flip on the side. 
And do you think you could make genuine money out of a thousand pounds? Oh yeah, easy. Really? Yeah, definitely. There's, there's so many different niches. Again, I'll just use golf clubs, right? People don't even know. People are so fast to sell off a golf club, but you can get like a nice tightless wedge and you can get it for 60 quid and you can sell it for 100. That's for, you can't do that. I mean, you can't make almost double bubble on, on most things. <laughs> so do you know what I mean? So I'm, how many people give away a couch every single day for free because they can't be asked to get rid of it? I'll take that and I'll flog <laughs> it on for 20 quid. <laughs> Love, so I love it. If I've only got a thousand pounds, I'm trying to make guaranteed money, and those are the things that you're making guaranteed money. But I'd, but I'd, I'd get a job too. Yeah, I'd make sure I get a job, a stable job with income to, to top that up with. With everything you've done and all the zeros that have ended up in your bank account, do you think you could go back and just do a job tomorrow, no problem? Yeah, no problem because I have to because the people that work for me, I have to put myself in their shoes and do things that they've done and even even go in to do their job to show them how to do it and, and help them. So of course. Got, no, not, got absolutely no ego to that. I love that. What about if it was 100,000 and not 1,000? Oh, good point now. What would you do? It's almost easy with the smaller amount. <laughs> yeah. Because I'll be taking more risks with, 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 the more, with more money. Um, but I would invest it in guaranteed, you want guaranteed money pretty much. There's nothing to guarantee, but I'd say something like the S&P 500 again. And that would be like a, a Vanguard 10% return a year again. But I'd probably take a more risky approach, but that's a safer bet. Man, it all it. depends. On, it, it's, it. They're so hard to answer because there's so many different things yeah. you can do. Do you know what I mean? It all depends on the person, the risk port, you know, their risk appetite. Most people, you know, aren't comfortable going to sleep with loads of risk, and which is absolutely fine to take less. That's what I'd be like. I wouldn't risk, have the. I wouldn't approaches. have the whatever to do. I'd basically give you the money and say, "Call me in a year." Oh dear. Tell me what we've made. I can't be dealing with this every day. The stress. <laughs> or, or, you could do, or you could do a house flip if you had a hundred grand. You know, you could put money in, buy a rundown house, the worst on the street, and do it up, lick a pint, um, new kitchen, bathroom, and then sell it on. Very nice. We've got a third question as well that's come in. Let's see who this one's coming from. Uh, Mark, evening, Mark. Hi. Enjoying yourself? Yes, Excellent. So, Lewis, everybody talks about the highs of business and the successes. What were your biggest failures? Oh, what are my biggest failures? I mean, again, I've had a, uh, I've had a lot um, in terms of things behind closed doors that, you know, unfortunately I can't fully go into detail with. But I've had a lot of failures. There's a lot of things that haven't worked. And do you know what? If they hadn't have worked, I wouldn't be the person I am today and I wouldn't be in the position I am today talking to, to everyone here with an interesting story. Any, fa any failure you have, you, 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 have to, you have to learn from it. It's just a part and I would never, ever, ever turn back the clock to, to, to the failure. Yeah, I've done things and, and lost a lot of money. Yeah, I've done things and, and you know, things haven't worked out and I've probably lost, I've lost friends too. As long as I'm always learning from it, I, mean, I don't really see them as, as failures at all. I wouldn't really use the word failures or learn, learning curves or growth. I love that. Very on trend. Um, <laughs> listen, before we, um, before we finish, we always have our quick fire questions on the High Performance Podcast. Um, one of the things that people love talking about are non-negotiables. Have you got three non-negotiables that you and all the people around you have to buy into? I'd probably say love is one. Nice. Empathy. And then that would lead to, to, to happiness. I mean, I'm not going to go into any of the other things you could say because at the end of the day, non-negotiable. Most things are negotiable. Those three things really aren't. If you're not happy, you're going to be sad. You know, if you don't love anyone, then you know, are you human? And you've got, to show emo you've got to show emotion to people. If you could go back to one moment of your life, what would it be and why? Ooh, there's always a part in life you'd like to go back to. Probably when I used to just sit at home when I was, you know, 12 playing games. <laughs> Not a care in the world, you know what I mean? <laughs> Nothing to think about, just playing games, you know, wake up in the morning, play a bit of game, play this game before we go to school, come back from school, play this game. So that's the, probably the most, you know, remem like memorable, because there's always emotion uh, uh, with your childhood that you, you, everyone wants to go back, but if you sent yourself back there, realistically, it wouldn't be what you thought it would be. It never is. How close is what you're doing today to playing games? I still play games now. Similar. But I'm talking about every day, like in business, just... Similar because you, yeah. are, you are playing a game, you know what I mean? You are playing, everything's like a game, there's always an answer. A game, there's like, uh, there's so many different variables in games, which is the same as like a business. You're playing a game, you're playing a game with competitors. Can I get a, above you? Can I get the most likes on Instagram with this picture, this viral content, whatever it is? You're playing some type of game with some type of metric. Just, just treat it as that really. Don't really take it too seriously. How important is legacy to you? Not that important, if I'm honest. Not that, not that important. I don't try and think that f 
that far. The only legacy I want to leave behind is to the people that knew me that know that my morals are high and, you know, I was just a, 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 let's say, a loving person because, you know, everyone's forgot about when, they, when, they, when they're gone. They don't care how successful you are at some point in the, in the world cycle. You're going to be forgotten about. So just focus on yourself and the people close around you. I wouldn't look too much into that, me personally. If you could see the teenage version of you, what's the one piece of advice you'd give them? Oh, give them a clip around the ear roll. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say... Just continue to be to be curious. I mean, everyone's personality is different. I was hyper, a little bit crazy and whatever, but that's fine. Channel it into something you, you really love. That's why I love things like Twitch at the moment. You've got all these kids, these gamers or whatever, making loads of money online, doing everything they love. So just always follow your passion. You know, if you truly, truly are passionate about something, you're going to find a way to make money. I've never, I won't say never, I said initially you set out to make a little bit of money. But past that, it's all about passion. And then you, all the money you make is a byproduct of the process. And your kind of final message for the people in this room and the people that have listened to this episode as part of the series of high performance, what advice would you like to leave people with? Your kind of one final message to them for living a high performance life. What do you want to ring in in people's ears? For the- no one is perfect. Don't look ever look around and, and look at people on social media and think they're perfect and think their lives are perfect and they've got everything etched out in stone and this is the path you have to follow because truth is, as I said, they're winging it. They just won't admit it. That's the difference. I'll admit that I'm winging it. They won't. They'll pretend that there's p- perfect people. So all, and always be curious. Like Follow your curiosity. It can lead you down so many rabbit holes. They'll lead to different things. And as I said, just be empathetic to every single person you meet. Like Smile at people. Anyone you see. People behind the scenes. Shout their hand. Acknowledge people. I think it will give you so much personal growth. And at the end of the day, the kinder you are to people, the happier it's going to make you, the more you're going to perform. Brilliant. What a pleasure to sit in here. that. Ladies and gentlemen, Lewis Morgan. Mate, thank you so much. Cheers, chap. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Thank you so much, mate. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.